Chapter 18 Orange and Eucalyptus Sabrina and Lindsay walked for the next few hours in silence, conserving their energy. They stopped for a few minutes to rest beneath an acacia tree, but even the shade was hot, and they decided it was better to keep moving. Lindsay pulled the needles and skin off a cactus, and they chewed the fibrous flesh. It was sugary and moist, but the water in it was not enough to quench their thirst, and the sugar left them feeling jittery and exhausted. By the afternoon, Sabrina's head was pounding, and no matter how she readjusted her head wrap, she felt no relief. Her lips felt shriveled, her tongue was sticky, and her throat was ash. In places, the road had crumbled, merging with the rocks and stones of the desert. Sabrina found herself fixated on these sections where the roots of desert bushes probed and cracked the tarry remnants apart. She remembered watching a docuvid on a type of parasitic tree that grew from seeds dropped by animals in the tops of host trees. The parasite tree would grow downward around the host tree, eventually strangling it. The host tree would rot, nothing left but the shape of its emptiness within the tree that had murdered it. It struck Sabrina as so poignant, that emptiness so infinitely inadequate and accusing. Anything could fit there. Anything imagination could make up. What was that? Lindsay asked. Nothing, Sabrina replied. She could barely recall what she had just said. Delirium was slowly settling in. For a moment, she was sure the road was actually an oily serpent beneath their feet, rising and falling through the sea sands of the desert. Then she was aware again that she was painfully thirsty. Her throat hurt, but she did not have saliva to swallow. Lindsay was not much better. Her eyes had grown blank, and her face waxen. When a row of large buildings appeared on the horizon, they turned toward them. The buildings spread over a large area. The lot for vehicles was an immense plain of cracking asphalt and rotting rectilinear vehicles, much less aerodynamic than the CRPs Sabrina and Lindsay had grown up around. In places, wild grasses had taken root through the paved surface, and the stalks rustled with the sound of crickets and field mice. A ground swallow fluttered past, startled by their approach. While Lindsay watched it fly over the wasted parking lot, Sabrina stopped, a distant rising cry in her ears. Lindsay, run! The sound was all around them, drowning out their footsteps and the swish of grass against their bodies. Sabrina felt as if they were moving in slow motion, the roar of the approaching Elved growing louder as they ran for the nearest doors to the building. The doors were glass and hot from standing in the face of the sun all afternoon. Lindsay took the handles, but nothing budged. Sabrina kicked one, the glass shattering with a pop. They hurried through, just as the sound outside changed in pitch and the Elved roared overhead, its shadow passing over the parking lot. The air inside smelled of bat guano, mildew, and melted plastic. They wrinkled their noses, but the atrium they entered was also cool and bright with light shining down from the skylights. A long, dry fountain waited just beyond the doors. Lindsay collapsed across the tiles. The sound of the Elved faded, and they were left in the humming silence of the abandoned shopping center. Immediately, weariness began to overtake them. The Elved gone, Lindsay's eyelids were drooping. Sabrina prepared two more bits of cactus for each of them before she leaned against the basin wall and drifted off into sleep. When she woke, the sun had moved and the shadows above had changed, revealing bats in the rafters. Most slept, but a few shifted their feet and readjusted themselves as one or two flapped about, their snapping wings a soft, desiccated handclap echoing through the empty shopping center. Here, the sun and elements had done less to take back the place and change it into dust and rubble. Advertisements remained in their bold letter assertiveness. The colors, the tone of insistence was alien to Sabrina a contrast to the simplicity of the shops in Fortinbras and the simple chalkboards the market sellers leaned against their sales carts, where the greatest variation was the color of chalk the seller decided on using that morning. This place reminded her of Lysander, but even the northern city focused on fashion and trends was a far cry from the blasts of stimuli here. This was an assault. None of this had the balance, beauty, or coherence of one of Lindsay's paintings. Instead, it had a fractured madness to it. A madness of fanaticism. Sabrina turned her gaze back to the walls of the fountain that surrounded them. 
as if it could be a bulwark against the visual chaos. But even the stones of the basin were painted in gaudy colors depicting imaginary sea creatures. The dead felt too close, the stone around them too much like a tomb. Or maybe she was just thirsty. She roused Lindsay. We need water. Lindsay agreed, steadying herself from a rush of dizziness as she climbed out of the empty basin. I thought of it just as I was falling asleep, she said, reaching out to the wall beside her. We passed a building in the lot outside. It was the type they would use for provisions. Believe us? Yeah. We should check it out. After listening for sounds of engines, they left the safety of the shopping center for the lone building that stood like an island in the middle of the lot. The hammer of the sun had blistered its walls, bleached the signage, and cracked the door handles. Pumps stood outside the front door, the cement beneath them stained from the fuel that had leaked from the rotted hoses. The main door screeched open, the base scraping the ground. Inside, Lindsay made her way to the counter that held the cash machine. While she disappeared behind it, Sabrina pressed the buttons until a drawer popped open, revealing paper money. She took a few bills, rubbing them between her fingers, marveling at the complexity of colors, watermarks, and holograms. This was worth something once. Not anymore, Lindsay said, her voice straining as she dragged a large trunk out from beneath the counter. Before opening it, she studied a series of marks stenciled into the edge of the counter. Unlike the aging dated items all around them, the trunk was new, and a design that was recognizable from any apartment in Fortinbras. Lindsay flipped the latch and pulled back on the lid, revealing a treasure trove of water bottles and wrapped biscuits. A sign on the inside of the lid read, Take only what you need, traveler. Leave the rest for those who will follow. They tore off the caps and drank quickly. The water was stale and tasted of the plastic bottles, but Sabrina could not remember a sweeter drink. Nice job, Sabrina said, helping herself to a biscuit. She handed one to Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay said as she chewed, then wiped crumbs from her mouth. Below the message on the lid ran another series of dashes and circles. Those are the symbols you've been following? Sabrina asked. Up till now. So those on the lid tell you the rest of the way? No. Lindsay replied, readjusting herself to her knees and re-examining the trunk. Too easy. If you, Cadet Sabrina Sabria, representative of the law, protector of order, and... All-around stooge for the ministry? Exactly. If you found this, you would think you have cracked the code. You would continue to follow the crescent and slashes on the backs of road signs, on rocks, on stumps. But they would lead to a dead end. Keeping the stooges out of your hair... So to speak, Lindsay yanked the trunk out farther and laid down in its place. These are the real directions. She pointed to the underside of the counter. Sabrina crawled in next to her and saw a series of new symbols. Sabrina adjusted herself on the floor, her weary leg muscles relaxing. If these rebels in the desert want to stay hidden so badly, what if we stumble upon them and they are not too happy about the surprise guests? Oh, they will be watching us for a long time before we ever see them. If they decide they don't like the looks of us, I imagine we'll be glad you're armed. They took two bottles of water each and four packs of biscuits and pushed themselves for the rest of the afternoon. The sun was lower in the east now, and the air cooler. Lindsay was sure they could reach another safe house by evening, but only if they hurried. They moved with greater urgency. The road was more intact. They regularly passed the remains of vehicles, rusting and withered from exposure. Shadows were growing long when they came upon a bus. It bore all the signs of having been engulfed in flames. The tires had disintegrated, leaving it to rest on its chassis, which the heat had fused with the asphalt. Plastic billboards on the sides had melted off and spread out over the roadway in long, frozen puddles. The roof was collapsed, the remaining windows dark with soot. Lindsay shrieked when she realized the shape she was staring at through the smoked glass was a charred face. Come on, Sabrina said, clutching her arm and steering her onward. More bodies waited at the front of the vehicle, face down, the flesh disintegrated, leaving blood-stained clothes wrapped around bleached bones. The front windscreen of the bus was spiderwebbed with gunshots. Lindsay froze at the sight of the driver slumped over the wheel. 
and a child's remains beside him. Sabrina tugged her again. Let's go. We knew we'd see stuff like this out here. In the early evening when the sun was an ember on the eastern horizon and their shadows were long and distorted, the road signs changed. Destinations, distances, roads were labeled with two, even three languages. The common Fortinbras tongue, plus two others. A blocky script and a flowing one. Sabrina could read neither, but she had seen both before. Tattooed Jacob and other Skrit's bodies. Twilight stars made pinpoints in a violet sky when they passed through an abandoned border gate. Heavy metal arms blocked the road between fortified towers. Narrow gun apertures stared down at them like slanting, angry eyes. The crossing felt full of ghosts, and they passed through in silence. The land grew hilly after that. Sabrina felt exposed to watchers on the higher elevations. Shells of houses clustered on the slopes. Olive, cypress, and citrus trees clustered around them. Lindsay's signs led them to a white house enclosed by a garden of orange and eucalyptus trees. They helped themselves to the fruit, squeezing the sticky juice into their mouths. In the back, they found a well with a hand pump, where they washed themselves and refilled their bottles. In another trunk on the porch, they found more supplies, as well as sleeping mattresses that they rolled out on the floor. The night air was cool and their wet hair and clothes made it refreshingly cold. Lindsay's breathing grew slower, and she was soon asleep. Sabrina remained awake, staring at the stars under the eaves of the porch. The sound of crickets and the wind stirring the tree branches filled her ears, but in her mind she heard the whoosh of flames, the retorts of gunfire, and the screams of children. Had their hands beaten against the glass before their soft flesh had been transformed to ash, or had they cowered under the seats in vain hope that the flames would not reach them, or that some reasonable adult would step in to save them? The sad lesson was that adults were not reasonable. She wondered what sect had been doing the killing, and which sect had been killed on that bus in those days just after the cataclysm, when retaliation ran rampant, and centuries-old blood feuds resurfaced. The same lips that had prayed with such reverence in candlelight were the same that cried for blood in the sunlight. It had always been so. Until her uncle. After what felt like an hour of waiting for sleep to come, she got up and paced through the backyard around the side of the house. Curled leaves crunched under her feet as she pushed her way through overgrown bushes. Something had been bothering her since Lindsay had said the rebels might not be exactly welcoming. She drew her blaster out of her holster. She had not tested it since they had fallen into the sea. She put it on its highest setting, aimed, and pulled the trigger. A gout of red plasma sizzled at the muzzle, then dissipated with a pop against the trunk of a tree. Eucalyptus by the pleasant smell lingering in the air as the bark smoldered. She tested the other, less lethal settings as well before she returned to the porch and fell into an uneasy sleep. The next morning, more biscuits, more water, and they began again before the sun was up and the air grew too hot. Sabrina noticed that the earlier C-shaped symbols appeared on some of the road signs leading eastward, but Lindsay pointedly did not follow them. Instead, she turned on a fork that bent westward into more hills. The slopes grew steeper, the roads at times circling the ridges, at other times rising directly to hug their slopes and skirt deep ravines. At midday they rested, taking advantage of a creek to wet the cloths tied around their heads. When the day's heat was at its worst, they slept briefly under a tamarisk tree, then started forward again when afternoon shadows began their crawl toward the horizon. Lindsay maintained a brisk pace, just short of a run. As the evening sun was sending red slanting rays across the valley, they saw a row of houses waiting at the top of a ridge. Lindsay announced that she could see the next safe house among them. Sabrina was already looking forward to the stash of sleeping mattresses and biscuits when Lindsay turned back, her eyes wide as the hills reverberated with the roar of jet engines. They began to run, the noise of flood, the stunted bushes offering no cover. Sabrina pushed them into a drainage ditch off the side of the road. The sun glinted off the Elved as it appeared through a gap in the ridges. It was flying low, scanning the valleys between the hills. It crossed over the road they had used a few minutes earlier then disappeared over another ridge. A second pass at a different angle, and they would be exposed. 
They sprinted uphill, fighting their fatigue and the heat. Which one is the safe house? Sabrina asked. She could have run faster, but Lindsay was having trouble keeping up. She put her arm around her friend and pushed her. The fourth one! On the right! Lindsay said, breathless. The fourth house was the only one with a chimney. Three bricks stood on end on the roof beside it, a subtle sign left by other rebels. But it was still too distant. The engines were growing louder again, and they still had too much open ground to cover. The nearest house had a yard bursting with overgrown trees and bushes. Sabrina pushed Lindsay toward it. Lindsay let out a little cry as her wrap slipped off her head. She slowed to grab it, but a breeze picked it up and it danced down the street out of her reach. Sabrina shoved her forward. No time! They threw themselves behind the garden wall, tumbling on top of each other. The Yelved passed over. Before the sound could fade, the machine banked and roared over a second time. Crite! He saw the head scoff! Sabrina said, grabbing Lindsay and running for the far end of the house. I'm sorry, Lindsay gasped. Sabrina kept them moving through the backyard. The engines had quieted to a hover. Bushes and trees danced from the turbulence in the air, and dust whipped up off the ground. While Lindsay continued ahead, Sabrina charged her suit and drew her blaster. The Elved was moving slowly up the road, thrusters at an angle as it scanned the ground. The betraying scrap of torn curtain tumbling in the jet wash. The next house was a pile of rubble. Sabrina and Lindsay skirted the fallen bricks and toppled roof, wedging themselves through a gap in the garden wall. The Elved's black carapace appeared through a gap in the fence. The next yard was even more overgrown. The safe house was still one yard away. A screened porch moldered in the shade beneath some almond trees. They slid into the crawl space, pushing past spider webs and rotting leaves. The Elved alighted on the rubble pile in the adjacent yard, the blocks and bricks settling beneath its weight. Engine heat radiated over them. The metal of the machine was ticking and creaking as it contracted. Lindsay kept her eyes shut, her lips moving silently. Sabrina pressed herself against the floor of the porch for a better look. The tip of the Elved's wing gleamed over the top of the garden wall. A boom echoed through the valley, bouncing off ridges and reverberating up through the ground. Lindsay's lips stopped moving, and she opened her eyes. It sounded like an artillery cannon, or a building detonation. The rubble shifted. The Elved took two steps, reignited its thrusters, and returned to the sky. The heat and smell of singed grass still hung in the air when Sabrina nudged Lindsay, and they wriggled out from beneath the porch. They ran like freed animals, ripping debris and spiderwebs from their faces and hair. Sabrina was halfway past the next house when Lindsay tugged on her arm. It's the safe house, remember? They scrambled up the wooden flight of stairs to an overhanging deck. The old railing shook with their banging feet. Lindsay shoved old deck furniture out of the way as she made for the back door. It opened easily, soundlessly, as if the hinges had been recently oiled. The two of them barged in, triumphant smiles growing across their faces, Sabrina snapping the door lock shut. When she turned, she saw Lindsay with her hands in the air, while three men on the far side of the room took aim over the barrels of their guns.